Hello, Hello to everyone and welcome to the first conference of Medieval Thought in Context, the Convergent Approaches, organized by Dragos Karma and myself uh, in, this in this new academic year. Uh, it is a pity that the unusual times now do doesn't allow to uh, to have trips of the speakers in order to deliver uh, their talks, but we are uh, nevertheless grateful to have these online platforms that um, unite all the participants from worldwide, and we can we can uh, we can still work and uh, exchange ideas and boost our energy for working through these uh, these conferences by just click, clicking once or twice. Um, and I am ha I'm especially happy to introduce uh, to you Dominique Poirel, who has been uh, for both Dragos and me throughout these years, a constant and warm presence in all projects that involve the Liber de Causis. And I, I, I have to say now some biographical um, uh, words about Dominique Poirel. He is the director of, of research at the um, Institut de Recherche et d'Histoire des Textes in Paris, and he is responsible of the Latin section in the same uh, institution. He is also teaching uh, at École Pratique des Hautes, uh, Hautes Études in the Religious Studies Department. He is in the Scientific Committee of the uh, Corpus uh, Christianorum. Uh, director of the collection Studi Artistarum and also has a, a very interesting project about the damaged uh, manuscripts from uh, the city of Chartres uh, who, has, who, who have been uh, bombed in the Second World War and he is one of the, the members that are charged to uh, um, that, uh, manage the, the restoration of some of the fragments and manuscripts that are left from these uh, uh, sad events and uh, give some detailed um, um, descriptions of, of the, the remnants. Uh, Dominique, Dominique Poirel's main area of interest is the religious, literary and intellectual history in the Middle Ages and especially the school of uh, Saint Victor that deployed its activity near Paris, uh, especially um, during the 11th and 12th century. Among his numerous publications, I would like to add just a few titles, like uh, Livre de la Nature et Débat Trinitaire au XIIIe siècle, uh, in 2002, Des Symboles et des Anges, Hugues de Saint-Victor uh, et Le Réveil Dionysien, on, uh, in 2013, Hugues de Saint-Victor, uh, uh, it's an it's a edition of text, Super Hierarchiam Dionysi in 2015. Um, as I was previously mentioning, Dominique Poirel was constantly present in the projects approaching the Liber de Causis. When Dragos um, first started um, the first project on this topic, he, um, Dominique was at Cluj, at the university in Cluj, and he was teaching two modules of intensive uh, courses in paleography, codicology, and ecdotics. He always replied affirmatively, uh, affirmatively to all invitations to colloquia, seminaries, workshops, regardless the country they were being organized in. Um, for the current ERC project, he kindly accepted to be, to be part of the steering committee and generously provides guidance when he is asked for. With Jules, Jean, uh, with Jules Janssens from the KU Leuven, he, all, he already participated in Dublin to a workshop um, in order to discuss uh, with us about the possibilities of engaging in a new, uh, re, in a, in a new edition of Liber de Causes. Uh, of course, the Latin liber liberty causes. Um, this time, taking by taking into consideration all extant manuscripts, which are over 2060, and to reach a version as close as possible to the uh, Arabic text used for the translation in, in Latin. Today, Dominique will present us a dossier with a rather descriptive uh, and pedagogical aim uh, in order to to show the multidisciplinarity of the research implying the medieval written sources. The title of his, um, his conference is, 
in French is uh, déciffrer, critiquer et interpréter le travail de première main sur les sources manuscrites d'après un commentaire inconnu sur le pater. Dominique, on te laisse uh, d'ici uh, la parole. Be present in some way with you and with Dragosh and uh, so many good memories since Cluj uh, and uh, to, to be with everyone. Uh, so, um, well, maybe I will share my screen. And uh, so. Oh. Uh, among the many wrong ideas we have about the Middle Age, Dark Ages, and so on, there is one, but most of you know that, that it's wrong, that, it, that there would be no discoveries to do. And I would like to show from a example that it's not true. We, we can do discoveries not only about unknown authors, but also about sometimes uh, famous authors. In this case, uh, Francis of St. Francis of Assisi. Actually, when you are uh, arriving towards the, the end of the Middle Ages. Well, because there are many, and also because they, they show uh, diverse difficulties, especially with the reality of deciphering, which requires diverse talents, and I'm ashamed of speaking of that in front of uh, Mark Smith, but there is a paleography to read ancient writings, codicology to understand uh, the whole of the manuscript, uh, Latin, medieval Latin to understand the text, but so, so that is just for deciphering but also we have to criticize uh, uh, textual criticism in order to distinguish good text and copy mistakes. Attribution criticism because many texts have no attribution in the manuscript. It will be the case of the text we will discuss or some attributions in the manuscripts must be discussed because they can be mistaken. And at least if we cannot uh, recognize the author, we, we should try to recognize the, the time, the, the area, the, the milieu. It, and uh, well, there is also historical critique critique, but that will not be mainly present here, but also linguistical criticism. What is the state of the language? And here we will see that although the text is Latin, this question must, must be uh, uh, discussed. And interpretation, that is, we have not, we, ha we must not read too too much with our modern spectacles. We, we, we must try to understand the text according to the interpretative format in which it was written. And so there are div diverse tools to try to understand the text within its literary and intellectual tradition, that is to, to connect it with the text which was its sources or the text, contemporary text with which it discusses. To 
try to be attentive to the intellectual methods which are not ours and sometimes we can just not understand the text because we are trying to interpret it with our uh, intellectual uh, schemes and first of all not to despise text but try to apply the principle of charity that is suppose that the text is consistent even if we didn't understand at first uh, it, the way it's con its consistency works so when something is strange we should not say that's normal these medieval authors are stupid but uh, to try to understand to try to, to think oh something is odd something is strange very good it means that through this oddity like a door i may i might enter into a thought diverse of mice of mine N not necessarily better or worse but diverse and consistent which has its own consistent and so i can learn something new from this thanks to this, this oddity which is a a door to an, an, an unknown world. A supplementary difficulty is that all these questions uh, are present at the same time. Uh, ideally, we should decipher first and then criticize and after interpret, but that's not the case. We, all the problems are always mixed and so uh, in order just to to read we have to, to already to interpret and we, we we read best what we expect but also at the same time what we expect can can be a screen so we we, we have to be uh, to, to, to know that these analyses as distinct, but are play often with several of them at the same time. The case I will speak about has a, its own history. It's, it comes from a private manuscript, which was sold uh, a few years ago. And so a private manuscript, so it was unknown by the, the specialists and it appeared soon that there was in it a, an unknown text, a, an edit, partly unedited text, a new life of Saint Francis of Assisi, which fit exactly an unknown life of which Jacques Dallara, a specialist of Franciscan studies among other things, had postulated the existence because he had gathered a few fragments of unknown lives, he had supposed that it was the same life. And from this, like a paleontologist reconstitutes the animal with a few bones, he had reconstituted, made, he had made many hypotheses about this unknown life, and all these hypotheses were confirmed by the discovery of this manuscript. No, no hypothesis remained unconfirmed. Uh, but this life, which was a big discovery, it was only uh, the eighth part in the manuscript. And the rest of the, this manuscript was also, seemed also very interesting. The manuscript, I will uh, say that uh, afterwards, uh, can, can be dated very early uh, for a Franciscan manuscript, probably the first preserved Franciscan manuscript, 1130s, uh, 1230s, that would be a very early Franciscan manuscript, uh, 1230s, uh, yes. So it was bought finally by Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris and immediately it was 
put online. So it's, you can see it uh, as well or may, maybe better than uh, in the original because this manuscript is very, very sh short. It's much shorter than what you see because it's eight centimeters on 12 centimeters. So it's like a, like a small sm smartphone. And Jacques Dallarin gathered a group of specialists of Biotech Nationale de France and IRHT to study it. So we shared all the texts preserved in it to, to transcribe them and to study them, to try to identify them, to understand what they was, were doing together. And I collaborated for uh, some text and among them a commentary on the, the Lord's Prayer, our father, which a very short text, only three folios, 43 recto to 45 verso. And then there were many surprises. First, the text is totally unknown, totally inedited. Second, it looks like nothing else. Its way of commenting, especially, is very strange. No quotation of former commentaries, uh, but the, the style, the ideas, the way of uh, commenting is very original. And thirdly, the personality of the author, as it appears from it, is very strong. Uh, it's someone who, who is very personal, uh, who, who, who dare to, to speak in the place of Christ, uh, who, uh, who is very harsh in the reproaches. For instance, in many commentaries on the Lord's Prayer, the reader is uh, is told to 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 tell that that prayer because by telling it by uh, meditating it he will progressively become better. But here the author says, "You are not worthy to to tell the this prayer because you don't do what you say." Others, so. He's beginning with harsh reproaches, and at the the end of every section, he he, he ends by uh, consolate consolation by sweet sweet words. So it's a very uh, affective personality. So if you want to know. To see, you, you, you just have to, to, to enter NAL 2245 20 on Google and you will uh, very quickly obtain the Gallica website, the digital repository of Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and there you can consult this manuscript. This manuscript, so, is very very little, very small. You see that the first page is nearly unreadable because it, uh, people think that it was probably carried as a, uh, not probably with a, under, under, a little bag attached, attached to the neck. It was a a portable uh, book and a portable library since it gathers a, a very big amount of, of texts of very diverse nature. Dominique? Yeah, oui? Oh, yes? Oh, oh, no, uh, we can't see your share screen if you ah. share it. I'm sorry. Ah. You? No. Yeah. Yes, yes. Ah, okay. sorry. I forgot. But from now, it becomes interesting to see. So, uh, uh, 
Um, ah, I don't know how to. Ah, yes. Here it's what it looks. It's first page, and here I go to the beginning of the the texts we will discuss now. So you have the beginning here, and on six pages. And this is the end. So, uh, uh, sorry, I would like. Oops. Okay. So, I will sh just show quickly uh, an example of the, the operations we did just on the first sentence. Uh, so, here is the text. First sort of transcription, respecting the fact that a part of the words are underlined. But this this must be corrected because there are mistakes in the text and even mistakes in the underli underlining of the text. And so here it's, uh, I toggle from transcription to edition. I add uh, a philology philological work in order to make the text more clearly available to the the reader. So I chose to put into small capital the words that are commented. I added what is obviously omitted because so this is obviously a copy mistake. There are there there was a monity instituti and uh, uh, no, so, sorry. Uh, there was a uh, monity, and the the writer wrote uh, instituti on the same pattern, but it's divina institutione idest ordinatione formati, idest formati. And so we see that there is here one and elsewhere other copy mistakes. So it's not the original. There is a distance between this copy and the original text, which is so probably a little older. So here, is, yes, and it is the, 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 the camera, it's something that should not be underlined. So here I put it not into, in a, small capital, but uh, regular letters, because it is the same, it's beginning the commenting of the text uh, commented on. Just a, a remark here, we see that the commentary on the Lord's Prayer does not comment only the prayer, but the in liturgical introduction of this prayer in the liturgy of the Mass. So that means that the text that is commented is not a biblical text, the text from Matthew, the Evangel of Matthew, but the liturgical text, and that's confirmed by uh, the fact that uh, uh, it's the quotidianum panem et not super substantialem panem. Uh, so it's a liturgical text that is commented on. So here is a translation. I, I'm not sure my English is perfect, but uh, well. Translation is always a, a best, a, a good uh, mean to, to test the, the edition and to, to check that we did, done the, 
let something uh, incorrect. So, this ciphering's you see, there were some problems. The, the ink uh, in some place, the ink was not of good quality. And in some places, the ink dropped. And so there are words that are not easily read. But fortunately, uh, a characteristic of the text is that there are many quotes of the Bible. And so, these and uh, trying to understand the consistency of the text makes possible to, to have very probable or probable or plausible uh, readings for what doesn't appear clearly. For instance, uh, here we have Agustino, uh, not Augustino, so Augustino, influence of the Italian, uh, testante, nisi Deus retribueret uh, bona promalis, as we don't see, non eset qui retribueret bona probonis. It's a little difficult, but since it was exceptionally quoting uh, uh, a father, Augustine, uh, it's easy to, 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 to understand. And there are other, uh, for instance, uh, fiat voluntas tua sicut in cello et in terra, it's, and, uh, and so on. So we can uh, uh, through the identification of the source, try to, to, to read what is more difficult. So you, you see already that uh, we cannot respect the transcribing and then searching the sources. We help one with the, the other in whatever sense is uh, useful. So textual criticism now. There are copy mistakes. We already saw one of them at the beginning. It's, and here, for instance, is another. Quia uh, a tempus creditis et in tempore tempore receditis, with a capital letter at receditis. Tempore tempore, it doesn't make sense. and since it's again a quote of the Bible, uh, we can uh, restitute in tempore temptationis. So, uh, an, a too strong abbreviation, an ambiguous abbreviation, maybe induced the copies to read tempore tempore. He didn't know what it meant, probably, but in tempore. Temptationis, we see that the big the words that have the same beginning, so it's more or less easy to, to make the confusion of, of them. Other little mistakes are not uh, textual but linguistical, paleographical, uh, secondary, for instance, negligetes. Uh, for negligentes, que instead of quem, except if this stroke is, uh, is, is in order to distinguish quem of que. And here, necitis for nescitis. Uh, it's not uh, that you should not be. Ne cities, but ne cities, you don't know. So that is, there are many, many of them. That's another difficulty, of course, but it's not only a difficulty, it's also a way of analyzing the cultural background of the writer, of the copist. And obvious, obviously, he's 
Italian, like the, the writing, and uh, and he is not very skilled in Latin. He, well, he has he knows enough of Latin to to write, but we see that the Italian is always trying to to appear. Now the attribution criticism. Who has written this text? And uh, well, we should have to, at the end, a name. But if not a name, we would try to, to make concentric circles and say when was it written, where, why, for whom, and how is which tools, with which sources, with which library. And what is the background of the author? Social, cultural, religious, intellectual background of the author. There is also the historical criticism. Since it's a text uh, and uh, in a book that was written very close to the beginning of the Franciscan orders, what does it teach? about the first generation of Franciscan friars. And so let us now examine diverse clues that, that I gathered from the inquiry. First, I'm, I slightly mentioned it, the large number of biblical quotations. Here is an example, an example so you see uh, a way of writing the text is to give, to, to make speak the law, to make speak the sinners, to make speak, uh, uh, well, above all the, the law, the Christ and the, the sinners, and they speak using quotations. And so many, you see, nearly every two lines, uh, you, you have a, a quote. So that's the first thing. Our first reaction would be to say that's a learned, very learned people because he knows much of the Bible. But I'm not sure that's true because uh, very learned scholars, of course they quote, but more than quoting, they integrate, well, it depends, of course, the, the times, but they, they, are, they are skilled in the way of using, integrate, integrating uh, quotations into their own discourse. And here you see, it's, the, the quotes are always something a little external to the discourse of the of the author. Second uh, cue, a large number of errors. So we already saw some of them. Here in a larger passage, you see that, uh, and these, the mistakes have diverse status. Uh, for instance, here we can, uh, we see that there are many confusion between singular and plural. So it's grammatical. And is it a copy mistake or is it a copy, a grammatical copy either of the writer who doesn't know enough Latin or of the author? There are also phonetic uh, problems. For instance, uh, me contemnitis, Similar words are, there are often confusions and uh, of that way. So maybe that speaks about the way the writer or the author was speaking a special type of Italian. And so with the aid, with the help of a specialist of vernacular uh, languages, we could identify, uh, and for instance, a colleague of ours 
uh, Fabio Zinelli says that it's Italy, uh, Italy but central, uh, maybe northern, there are other features, uh, but above all, central Italy. And some also uh, obviously copy mistake, for instance, quam, in written quando, and uh, but here it's one hypothesis to reconstruct the text. I'm not absolutely certain of the, the reconstruction, but there is a problem. In the so I spoke of the influence of the vernacular language in the style, at least. I mean, uh, we had a discussion with uh, Michel Zinck, a specialist of Old French, and he says that what is typical uh, of someone who doesn't think in Latin, like a learned scholar, is the fact that he constructs constructs its, his sentences with just appositions instead of subordination. And here you have, it's very frequent to have sentences like this with and, 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 instead of making uh, parallelism, uh, uh, syntactic complexity, uh, so we, we have a lot of uh, such features uh, and that means that the author, or at least the result of what did the author is roughly correct Latin, but we see that it's, it's written or thought by someone who is used to, to think in vernacular language, not in Latin. So it's not a very learned uh, author. The author has also a lack of theological training, which is to note in, because the commenting the Lord's Prayer is a theological uh, act. Here, there are many tiny examples. Here is one, it's a, a little subtle example, but uh, well, I give it uh, to you as it is. Here we, we, we see, as says the apostle, uh, you are, uh, you have as a father uh, the devil and you want to do his works. That's correct. Like says the apostle, it, it's a quotation of John, the evangel of John, who is an apostle. So at first sight, it's perfectly correct. But it's strange that a learned theologian would say that because actually it's written by St. John, but it's a word of the Christ. So saying that this, as says the apostles, when the Christ is speaking, it's sort of retrograding the authority of the sentence. And the apostle without precision, it's most of the time Saint Paul and it's not Saint Paul. So it's possible, but it's odd. It, it's not what would do someone who is used to the schools. And there are other cases like that. So limits, cultural limits from the point of view of uh, scholastic uh, or scholar uh, uh, way of, of speaking, of writing, but a very strong and efficient eloquence. There is a lot of exclamations uh, like that, uh, very, very uh, this, the person who wrote that he has a talent to a rhetoric talent and he likes uh, 
exclamations with O, with quam, or quanta, or quantus. Uh, there are lots of them, and there are uh, passages with accumulations of such exclamations. So we see that uh, someone who, who is maybe not a, a good uh, scholar, but he, he has a certain uh, uh, skill in uh, addressing other people. And here are two is a sort of periods uh, with a strong devotion to the crucified because uh, it's the Christ himself that is speaking and he's making a reproach of all the, uh, the bad things he, he suffered during the patient. And there are two passages uh, which end up with the same kind of sentence et vos miki panem queritis eternalem et vos miki panem queritis angerorum like a refrain like a re sort of poetic repetition uh, at the end of the two two paragraphs so and in every one uh, paragraph there is a description um, uh, of all the tortures, uh, to all the sufferings, uh, and uh, it ends with a contrast. So you say, uh, uh, give me our daily bread, and I am, I am the, says the Christ, I am the uh, bread of the sky, and here is what you did do to me, every time you are unfaithful to, to the words of the, the, the prayer, uh, you, you are crucifying me every time you, you, you do evil. And so you do evil, and after that you want, you, you, you dare to say, uh, give, give us our daily bread. So you see, it's very strange way of inciting to to, to recitate the, the prayer, but it's a way of, uh, more of saying what you say, uh, say it consciously and act in, co in coherence with what you say. But it's very striking way of speaking, very uh, uh, emotionally also uh, very strong. There are some traces of chivalric ethics. Uh, just one of them. Uh, the same uh, paragraphs we examined. Uh, well, uh, you cast lots for my game, garments and hanging naked on the cross for you. I was left alone on the field. Solus remansi in campo. At first sight, I say, well, it's not a big deal with this expression. And, and afterwards, I think, but, but oh, uh, I remained alone on the field in campo. It's not exactly the case because Christ is crucified on a hill, not on a field. And I made a general research in all the Latin text uh, concordances, and I saw that uh, th this expression, remanere solus in campo, is not very frequent, but each time it appears, it's in military context. This field is the battlefield. So, I remained alone on the field, that is, you, my armed companions, you, you left me, you, you, you didn't fight with me, you left me alone against the enemies. And so, it's very tiny, it's very subtle, but 
with little things like that, we see that this man has uh, some interest for some habits with uh, chivalric uh, ethics, with chivalry, chivalric habits. So, of course, uh, in the case of St. Francis, who, who was uh, uh, the son of a merchant, but we know also that uh, he took part to two military expeditions and his father would have liked Francis to become a, a noble, a, a knight. Uh, and that was possible by taking part to fights uh, in battles. And so let us now compare with some features which are also found in St. Francis's text, stylistic and doctrinal. This way of speaking with accumulation of exclamations is, can be found, uh, well, it's not uh, so rare, but it's found in uh, texts by St. Francis, like this uh, letter to, uh, with the, the same way of uh, accumulating uh, exclamations, oh, quam, and so on and repetition uh, of that. This way of writing uh, is, it's also very, what you can find in abundance in Francis texts. Uh, uh, not alone, of course, but we see that this, the same cultural background. Ah, a doctrinal, uh, still very subtle. The diverse times in the commentary, uh, there is an insistence of not, not uh, blasphemate, not uh, speak unworthily, invoking God's name. Uh, what you say, when you say our father within, in heaven, uh, you are, it's a blasphemy because of the way you, you live. And uh, the same, uh, the name, the, the Christians say we, we, we have the name of Christ because we are baptized. So now we are Christians that means we have received the name of Christ. And it's, don't, uh, don't think that because uh, God says my name is great among the, the, the nations, those who really repent. But you, since you act uh, you, you do evil and you don't repent, you blasphemate God's name. And this is uh, consistent with what you find with insistence in St. Francis, for instance, in the Cantico di Frate Sole, e nullu homo e ne dignu te mentovare. No man is worthy to mention you. And non sumus digni nominare te, who are not worthy to name you. This is not so frequent, but it's uh, a common insistence both in St. Francis' text and in uh, this commentary. So, if we sum up what we have seen, a uh, large number of biblical quotations of errors, vernacular languages, lack of Theological training, nevertheless, effective eloquence, trace of chivalric ethic, stylistic and doctrinal features akin with what St. Francis is used to do. It makes something close. It doesn't permit an identification, certain identification, but we are in the same area. And we could add also 
a dramaturge character of the commentary. The commentary is mainly a sort of drama with Christ speaking to the sinner, the sinners answering to Christ, and a sort of uh, the, the, the author, which is or rather a narrator, who is a sort of well, like the chorus in Greek uh, tragedies, someone who comments, who, who says, oh, uh, how, how great is uh, Christ who is so miser misericordious, or oh, how the, the sinners are uh, uh, silly not to convert. Uh, so we, there is something uh, theatrical in the, the way of commenting uh, the Lord's Prayer. And this feature with others is very conformed to what we know of the way of preaching on St. Francis from uh, Thomas of Celano, who's, who gives examples of St. Francis preaching and with uh, his body, with uh, ways, uh, he was very imaginative in his way of preaching. And uh, for instance, he stopped silent uh, and he wept. And uh, he, he had, a, well, there is the, the, the alternation between hardness of reproaches and tenderness of effusion, the def, dev, devotion to Christ on the cross. And the last feature, uh, Maybe I, I, I didn't show it, but there are many clues showing it that it's a reportatio. A reportatio that is uh, during a preaching or a teaching, someone takes notes quickly, and from these notes, afterwards, he reconstructs most possible of the text. And there are clues, for instance, uh, many quotes are ended uh, with etc. or some uh, parts of, we see that there are pieces of the, of the, of the thoughts which, which are lacking because one goes from one idea to the other very quickly without uh, seeing easily what is the link between the two and well there are some some features like that and so a reportatio means that you are taking notes of someone who, who, who is speaking and you think is important someone you are giving authority to him even if he's not writing but speaking so it should be a an important person. And now, if we add to these internal clues some external clues from the manuscript itself, we can go a little further. Many analyses were made on the manuscript, for instance, carbon 14 dating of the parchment, of the binding, which tends to say that it was written, well, from the writing, the specialists we consulted say it's second third of 13th manuscript. I don't know what Mark will say because, uh, and from the codicology, we are very invited to say beginning of the, of these, of these, of these interval, the writing is above and below the first rule line, and so this is beginning to change. Eleven uh, twenties. Uh, we have ancient divisions in of the Bible in the chapter, and from the the same eleven twenties, thirties. It's the Parisian, uh, well, probably from Stephen Longton, way of uh, dividing the Bible in chapter is extending. Uh, 
the texts written in the book that that are very that most of mostly 12th century or before but also the first some extracts of Saint Anthony of Padua of Padova uh, and uh, the comparison or also the some Franciscan texts and the comparison with the critical editions show that it's a very ancient version of the text. For instance, the Admonitiones of St. Francis. It's uh, uh, in the stema, it should be very, very close to the archetype. Another feature, the vita, the, the life of St. Francis, new life, uh, is addressed to Friar Elias of Cortona. And that's a very important uh, clue. Because if we look at the list of ministers general of the Franciscan order, we see that Friar Elias of Cortona was general minister general in the years 1230. Uh, and he was very controversial. There were a lot of, of uh, Franciscan, especially the learned Franciscan, the, um, who didn't like him, who said he was too much authoritarian. He was, uh, and he was also, he wanted to make uh, this splendid basilic of Assisi to St. Francis, but very expensive and very beautiful, very artistic. Uh, and they say it's not uh, the ideal of St. Francis. And Fra Friar Elias was a friend of St. Francis. For him, nothing was too beautiful for, for this saint, this friend, uh, the wonderful people. Uh. And so the, the result is after Friar, Friar Elias, there was Albert of Pisa, and shortly after, Friar Hemo of Faversham, who was the representative of the very learned of scholastic Franciscans. And from the time of Friar Hemo began a new period in the Franciscan order because it, the, the order was more democratic in some way, that is, the decisions were taken more regularly with consultations, but also more aristocratic in the sense that uh, the, it, was, it was more and more important, necessary to be uh, a priest to become a Franciscan, and uh, uh, as preferably a learned priest. That is, the Franciscan order from that time began to look like Dominican order, so that, uh, like uh, Jacques Dallara says, we could wonder whether at that time uh, Francis of Assisi could have entered the Franciscan order uh, because he was neither a priest nor learned. And so uh, we see that all the cultural background of the manuscript from what we saw for this text, but it, that's true also for the other text, fits very much with what is prior to Friar Hemo of Faversan. Another codicological fact, the section of the manu manuscript where our text is written contains just before two Franciscan texts, two texts by Francis, the Regula Bullata, uh, well, a part of it because the beginning uh, has been lost, and the Admonitiones of St. Francis. And here is the end of the Admonitiones, and then the commentary on the, uh, of the Lord's Prayer. And you see that uh, it's the same, the same hand, the same writing. There is 
Nous... Pardon, pardon Dominique, je ne vois pas d'image. Je ne sais pas si les autres voient l'écran. Ah Est-ce que c'est partagé Oui, moi je vois l'écran de Dominique. Ah bon D'accord, bon, je, je vais le trouver alors. <rire> je vais, vais l'arrêter puis je vais le remettre. Peut-être que, peut que ça remarchera. Merci. Est-ce que ça apparaît Oui, c'est bon. Bon. Alors, évidemment, je suis désolé, c'est un peu petit. Euh, okay. So, it's the same writing. Uh, there is no... For instance, at first time, we thought that this was the sort of rubric of this text, but not. It was the, uh, something concerning the, the, the end of the the admonitiones, and so the text, our, our text is anonymous with a title, and but copied afterwards, it could be an appendix to, to what precedes. So it, is it by St. Francis himself? I just would try to, to, to show that it's possible. Nothing, well, there are Uh, objection that could be made and we can discuss uh, but for instance it already exists a commentary by St. Francis on a Lord's Prayer but and it's very different but I think like some other scholars that the traditional uh, commentary is not by St. Francis and the manuscript the, the most ancient manuscripts do not say that it's written by St. Francis, but they say that it's a prayer that he, the commentary that he liked to, to pronounce, uh, probably that was very important for him. But you can see uh, for, from the text that it has been, the other commentary, that it has been composed by a very learned person who like who know very good Latin someone like Anthony of Padua of Padova who know rhymed and rhythm prosa artistic prosa and that's a very good Latinist can do that so uh, there are some objections that can be done but I think that they are not conclusive and uh, we can turn to them if you want afterwards So, but I cannot show that it's, it is certainly by St. Francis. But what I think is very certain is that this text, this text uh, had its birth among the first community of, I would not say Franciscans, of penitents, of uh, lay penitents, with some priests uh, among them. That is the, the first group of uh, penitents that was at the origin of the Franciscan order. But the culture that this text shows as also other parts of the manuscript show that uh, we are very close to the, the origin of the, the text. It, Saint Francis died 1226. If this text is as it shows, as it uh, seems from the 1230s, you see that uh, it's very close. And so at least I think we are before the, the years 2040s. Oh, at, well, it is, it is not representative of the years 2040s because Uh, at the time of Simon of Hemo of Sam, it, it was very improbable to copy a text uh, and to copy the address to Friar Elias of Cortona, who was uh, a very controversial person. He was condemned uh, and, well, uh, 
you were reproved by the, the order at, at the time of Saint of, of Friar Hemo. So here is what I wanted to, to tell you, just to show you that there is much to discover and we have to, to use every, every possibility of inquiry to, if we want to, to solve the difficult question of the question of attribution when there is no written name of uh, author in the text itself. Thank you a lot, Dominique, uh, for this very rich presentation. And it, it has indeed showed very clearly that we can discover uh, something very precious in a, in, a, in a apparently modest manuscript. And I have, I, I remember, I have seen the the official presentation at the Benef when um, Jacques Dallaran uh, explained all this and showed the manuscript was there and. Uh, I remember it, it was very, uh, it, it, everybody was very uh, touched by, by, by the discovery of this manuscript. But I, I sh and, and we can see also the, uh, that the approach is combines different, um, different methods and disciplines in order to uh, put the, the right question and find something uh, that needs to be said about the, the text. And, and find some, some answers about uh, at least uh, the surroundings of the creation of the text, if not the author and the, the, the exact date. And there are so many things that I, I, don't, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know in my, in my <laughs> head. Like, for example, this usage of, of putting a, a manuscript uh, in, a, in a case and, and carrying it at the neck, who 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 would have done this and why and and uh, does uh, does the context of a, re a reportatio explains the the small errors of Latin or the abbreviations which are a bit uh, uh, trunked? Um, I, I I I was I I'm really <laughs> I, I like to 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 think that always I we can we can go further um, through discussions and 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 people can can share their ideas in order to um, get to a richer picture. And for example, I, I wouldn't have, um, I, I, at the first sight, I wouldn't have said that uh, the first, uh, the, tech, the previous text in front of the, the commentary of Our Father is the same hand. Well, but it's just, it was just a fugitive uh, um, picture and, and I, I it's it's not that I, I I say something about it, but it's just at the first sight it doesn't look like, and and the, we can clearly say that you have uh, analyzed the context of the manuscript and decided this was the case, and you you don't have to you don't have to um, put the image again because I'm not. <laughs> uh, maybe I can try to to show you a, a, a bigger image because uh, I. It was not very easy. Uh, of, of course, probably there is a, uh, an interruption between the copy of the upper part and the, the, the following part. And uh, but um, yes, with uh, we, we 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 are not we we had difficulties to with the handwritings because uh, it's a close community. Mm -hmm. The, the, the hands, except some ones, are very similar, but uh, progressively we 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 could uh, recognize Denis Musrel especially and Maria Gurado and lots of hands and uh, for this part of the manuscript it seems. Uh, it seems uh, uh, very probable to yes yes i think uh, but I, I admit that uh, the image i gave you was not uh, if enough to 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 study the the, the question so i'll enter uh, 
So I so I'm in the well. I do as I said. So null 3245, and immediately we have uh, this kind of script, and uh, I will try to to go to. Uh, it was, uh, I, I said this just it reminds me that I always I always when I look at the manuscript and, and try to to compare two hands I am so pretentious that I would like the hand to be identical and I, I never know exactly when to decide it's the same hand and I have had this uh, uh, challenge for <laughs> in many cases Here, here we are. Mm -hmm. I will ask uh, to, to, how do I do, to have it uh, zoom. Mm -hmm. Oops. Here maybe you can see from there in the previous and uh, here it's it's beginning here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, the G's are, are are very trying to find all the G's like that. But here it's a little uh, more uh, dense, the upper part. The, well, yes. maybe well, you can I, go I, on uh, searching. I, would, I, would, uh, I wouldn't be the right specialist <laughs> to, to commentate upon this. But I, but I, 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 I thank you for, for this bigger image and for all for all your efforts in order to depict a, a, a whole image from small to big, and and um, thank you very much for for doing this for us. And regardless of my remarks that are only uh, admirative, um, I would like to ask the other participants if they would like to ask you something, or they have maybe uh, opinions to share, and you can raise the hand or or. or uh, I think you can also uh, write a comment, but it's better to speak since we are um, online. Yes, Dominique. Uh, just in passing, I, I also agree that the, uh, the writing does look like the same hand in different circumstances with the the bottom of the page so it's slightly larger and uh, uh, different ink and so on. Uh, they do look very similar. Um, I was wondering, I, I don't quite remember what the other texts in the volume are and whether any others might be attributed to St. Francis or are they more, sort of more common texts? Uh, the two texts that can be attributed to St. Francis are, are the two just before this, this one, that is uh, la, the regul, regula bulata, mm. the admonitiones, uh, and, there is, and afterward there are texts, uh, one text about St. Francis, uh, the life. Mm. Yeah, the life. There are quotes of St. Anthony of Padua, uh, and the rest is very heterogeneous. There are some uh, parts of biblical texts, Evangel of Matthew, uh, Prophet, Prophet Zachariah, uh, Book of Job, 
not untied, uh, not always untied. And uh, there are odd texts um, like the uh, Pseudo Methodius, uh, which is an apocalyptical text mm -hmm. about uh, where it's about as Ismailite. Uh, and uh, one of the scholars put that in relation with the Mongols, but maybe it could be since uh, too. Uh, and what is very, well, it, very, very diverse text. There are frilly, frilly, frilly ledgers. Um, monastic frilly ledgers, for instance, with the uh, importance of St. Bernard. Uh, but also one for Jum has uh, extracts of uh, 50 different diverse authors, but mainly uh, St. Jerome, Isidore, and Seneca, mm. uh, and Augustine, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so even the, the position of this text uh, coming immediately after two texts that are known to be by Francis is also, I suppose, something that suggests they could have grouped texts by Francis at the beginning of the of the book. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And about the history of the text, it's it's something intermediary between the common manuscript and the, um, called in French, recueil factice, mm. uh, that is accidental uh, book made from diverse books or parts of books. It's neither one, neither the other, exactly. It's something intermediary. In between. Mm. We see that there are parts of the text that were written uh, separately and gathered afterwards. But we see also that the hands, uh, we, we find hands from one part to the others. And so, except the last part, which is the, uh, I think, the, yes, the commentary, the, the book of Matthew, incomplete, we see that uh, it was the same community. And the display is about the same, not exactly, but about the same. So we see that they have habits of making small books that were uh, in ordered, intended to, to become one single book, or who could be gathered as a sing symbol book. Mm -hmm. So we see that's very, it's very commentary way of uh, writing. Mm -hmm. Partly independent and partly uh, collective. How is that reflected in the code ecology? Do you have different texts on separate choirs or we have uh, groups of choirs that correspond to texts that finish at the end of the choir. But that is crossed, for instance, by the fact that uh, hand A, for instance, can be found in one group of choirs and another group. So, uh, It's uh, there are at least we see that there are three groups of groups in this way. One, uh, the last one, it's Matthew Evangel, and that's probably the story, but uh, it was not intended. Uh, uh, but all the rest see that there is something uh, very common. Uh, Thank you. Uh, 
Dominic, I would have a question. I'm not sure if you can hear me now. Yes. Um, I would have a question. Uh, thank you so much, obviously, for your talk. I enjoyed it very much, and I'm very happy that you uh, uh, gave this, you. this talk here. Um, and I'm very excited to think that this might be indeed the authentic uh, commentary, so to speak, by St. Francis. Uh, on uh, our father, my my question would would come exactly on one of the um, of the points that you raised during your talk. Um, it's about the orality of the science of orality that one can see there, indeed. And even before you reach your conclusion, uh, I was uh, writing down here in my notes that the fact there is this. Um, I don't know, the numerous exclamations, uh, the way of trying to pace with the other through a sort of descriptive and pious language and so on, would, would indeed make someone think that is like a sermon, like some, yes. there is the traces of morality that are obvious. I wasn't aware of the fact that um, we can find the same stylistic uh, structures in uh, San Francisco as well, um, uh, but I was wondering if 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 we think if we think about this text as a um, as reflecting some form of reality, uh, we I wonder if it's uh, possible to imagine that it's not like a well structured or properly speaking commentary in the in a very structured way that we would be used to see a commentary in a later period uh, but it's more like a sort of uh remembrance or remembering or something like a souvenir of of what uh, a, a gathering of souvenirs of a gathering of ideas that probably circulated through San Francisco in the community, the small community that they had there. Uh, so probably even the, we can we could even imagine the idea of or the hypothesis of a later composition in a sense of writing down the text after the death of or shortly after the death of San Francisco, not necessarily during the life of San Francisco. Is it possible to Imagining that it's he is the author, is it possible to uh, trace more clearly the, the the date of this text, or do we have any idea where this this text could be situated in respect to Saint Francis' life or after life, <laughs> after death? I cannot, I cannot answer uh, with set to to that question. Uh, what is for me very confirmed is that it reflects the something that was probably very uh, frequent but which is this exception lost that is uh, trace frail traces of uh, the preaching and I, yes i agree with you it's uh, sort of homily uh, um, by the former generations of uh, Franciscans and with probably the memory of uh, Saint Francis and what I didn't say is that uh, you know the, the poverty uh, in St. Francis, uh, in fr Franciscan orders, had the consequence that they, they had, didn't have, uh, very few people had a breviary in order to pray the liturgical uh, office of ours. And so the rules say that those who do not have a breviary, they, they will uh, pray with uh, Lord's Prayer. And so I am 
I tried to count the number of time uh, they they recitated Lord's Prayer during one day. It's I, 50 times, I think, because uh, they tried to replace the recitation of uh, psalms by recitation of uh, our Father. And so, uh, very, very important. So, uh, but yes, the, and about the mixture of uh, orality and scribality, there are also things that uh, can be shown that are interesting. Well, uh, uh, if I, for instance, uh, I'll, I'll go to the, yes, this one. Here, it's the beginning of uh, the fourth prayer. Panem nostrum quotidianum danobis odie. Idest lacrimarum effusio est, uh, et panis est paburum verbi. Uh, et spiritum rectum, uh, et eucharistia. Here, mm -hmm. typically, uh, um, a um, Ah, I forgot the Latin word because I speak in uh, another language. Uh, uh, the fact of when you have one word, you say the diverse meanings it can have. Uh, it's uh, not divisiones, but... Uh, uh, distinciones. Distinciones. Thank you. <laughs> so the bread means either... Uh, the effusion of tears or Eucharist or the word. Uh, and this is a typ typically scholar, uh, scholastic way of... Uh, and... but it's... and often in, in uh, learned sermons you have it at the beginning and that is used in order to make uh, a commentary, uh, allegorical or tropological commentary according the diverse. But here it's just here, and they do nothing of it. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, it's just uh, the, the strength of the words of the prayer and the discussion between Christ and the sinners. Christ in cross, as, uh, as we read, and uh, sinners uh, that at the end became, uh, became uh, commuted and convert. And so we see that in this text, there is a sort of mixture between little bits of uh, learned culture and other features from uh, semi-learned or unlearned uh, culture. And I think that is very connected with the fact of reportatio. Because with reportatio, you have an oral word that is uh, written again, enfin, or written, and a little transformed because uh, notes is very few. Uh, and so it's a little adapted by the cultural background of the one who writes the reportation. So there is a sort of, not conflict, but tension between two cultures in this text and in the, the whole manuscripts. For instance, in the manuscript, you have very typical uh, Italian, uh, spiritual, uh, not very learned uh, background. And in other parts, you have uh, uh, traces of teaching in Paris. But this is possible within a, f a f community, 
like a Franciscan uh, community where you have uh, people living in a place and one or two members are going to study in Paris and they come back and so uh, it's something, it's a mixed object and it in this text I think it appears even within the texture of the text because it puts together orality and scribality, uh, learning and uh, traces of not much learning, uh, Latin and influence of uh, Italian. Thank you, Dominique. May I, Yuda, may I have another question? Yes, okay. yes. Um, and I was wondering uh, if, um, because it, this is due to my ignorance, I'm not sure if I can say more about what you definitely can, Dominique, um, uh, about um, the traces of vernacular language in other texts by St. Francis, uh, because this is one of the, the aspects that you mentioned in your talk that that sometimes we we might f find some some words or, or phrases that might recall probably central or northern italian uh, vernacular is it possible to find similar uh, words or traces in other texts by by francis that would oh, good question I think that most of the texts of St. Francis share the same city. That is, uh, for instance, there is the Passionis. I don't want to say that it's not by Fran Francis. He, he had the intention and he took part in it, but we, we have clues and the Franciscan uh, specialist uh, of St. Francis are admitted uh, may, most of its texts were co-written with other more learned uh, but in one text we have the work uh, materially I will try to, to show it to you uh, it's an autograph of St. Francis uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Oops, sorry, I, I lost up and uh... I have a photograph of it if you like. Ah, my, wonderful. <laughs> I'll try and share my screen. Wait, in this case, I'll have to. I'm not uh, allowed to, yeah. No, I, now, no, one second. Now you are allowed to share your screen as well. Ah, okay. But I, I think I can uh, find it. Can you see it? Can you see the picture? Oh, yes, I can see the picture. Dominique, can you see it? Whoops. Ah, I must put this one. It's for later. Ah, wonderful. Yes, it is this one. Uh, yes, I can. Ah. Uh, Want it larger? Yes, and, uh, you can see that uh, in some places it was corrected. And for instance, uh, well, uh, there was a paragraphic uh, and linguistic studies, but uh, for instance, here you see clearly in oak. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, fifth line in yeah, oak, yeah. H was added. The decimus above was probably written decimus. Uh, and something was rubbed by, well, uh, and there are many, above all, 
in the at the beginning uh, it's well it's a it's a small letter if you want from San Francis to Friar Leo so it should be Fratri Leoni Franciscus tuus salutem et patiem and it's the opposite uh, so there is a confusion with cases with grammatical cases uh, uh, it's a text that is known also by the hagiography had, by the life of saint francis by uh, thomas of Cirano, because Fra Leo was, un, was uh, disturbed and he asked uh, a text by Saint Francis uh, like a memorial uh, and uh, uh, and so Saint Francis uh, wrote this text uh, for him. Itatico Tibi Wonderful. And so you see, it became the, a relic, uh, holy object, mm -hmm. not only a message. And you see, now you see it all. Uh, it's one of the two, I think, two autograph texts by St. Francis. And even that, there are already interventions. So by another, uh, but even by one who probably would have liked to, to keep it as something genuine. But uh, so you s that permits us to, to see that we cannot say that St. Francis didn't know Latin. He, he knew some Latin, but it's not regular Latin. He, it's uh, he, it's a Latin from someone who, uh, who, who knows Italian much better, <laughs> and uh, and he, the result is uh, eighty percent uh, Latin, if you if you want. Thank you, Dominique. It's nevertheless extraordinary to have this <laughs> proof of writing of St. Francis. Yes. <laughs> and uh, very typical also is uh, the double F. Uh, Francisco, Francisco Tuo. And that it's a feature that we find often in the manuscript. Double F or double S? Double S, yes. Double S, yes. Yeah, Francisco Tuo, you wonder if it's a dative or if it's just plain Italian. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it should be Franciscus Tuus, but... Uh, uh, and yes, if we think it's lat Latin, there is a mistake because it seems a dative, but... Uh, and Leo? who should be vocative or dative, uh, here seems to be the, the sub subject of, uh, and it's the, 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 the opposite. I have a small question about something you said, um, a, a quotation that ends with etc. Yes. The sign could, could be something typical of a reportatio. Ah. Yeah. Now, I just thought it was a common way of saying 
end of quote, you know, unquote. Uh, do you find that more often in repartitionists than uh, other kinds of commentaries or do you find that an interesting idea? But I don't know. Uh, yes, Th that the etc. alone are not a proof of reportatio because we can find it in uh, university. Uh, uh, yes, and he, they give the beginning of the quote and for the rest you know. Uh, here, what is a little uh, special is that uh, it makes, uh, you have just a few words and uh, it, it is not understandable uh, without the rest. Uh, but of course, uh, they can rely on the memory of the, of the reader. So this sign, this clue alone would not be enough to say that it's a reportatio. What is the complementary facts is that uh, often they, uh, in French, they pass du coq à l'âne. Uh, th there is a, for instance, there is something very sad, and just af after that, uh, there is a, a praise of God uh, <laughs> for what he has uh, done. So uh, we, we, we see that a part of the reasoning is missing. Uh, yeah, non sequitur. Non sequitur, yes. <laughs> uh, also, in the two uh, texts about the patient, uh, very strangely, the order of the uh, events of the patient are in a totally uh, bizarre order. Uh, he's in the cross, he's arrested, uh, and so on. And so maybe it's improvisation or all improvisation. Maybe it uh, uh, difficulty of putting in order notes. But I think in all cases it showed that uh, the the original text was oral, uh, oral, uh, oral text rather than something meditated and written uh, at the same time um, but there are and of course uh, yes I, I forgot to say but uh, sometimes once the 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 the, the, author, the author text is addressed to fratres uh, uh, as interlocutors and uh, also uh, at one moment, uh, the personage, which is sort of chorus, of uh, the, the tragic chorus, says, we have left everything to follow you. So that shows that the reception, milieu of reception is a community of religious. Uh, but you see, we have lots of little clues and we have to to gather them in order to, 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 to build the, the result of the inquiry. But here we must, we cannot arrest St. Francis as the, the murderer of the inquiry. He, he, he might be, but we are not sure. That's Could you propose what I, yeah. 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 Non, Irene, est-ce que je peux <rire> poser une question en français? Euh, donc, je, je suis, j'ai été très frappée par euh, votre euh, exposé parce que nous a enseigné, disons, comment il faut euh, détecter tous les éléments qui, qui peuvent nous donner euh, un texte pour euh, découvrir l'auteur et... Euh, donc, soit la langue, soit la, la, la culture. Et ce qui m'a frappé, c'est, je ne, je ne l'aurais jamais remarqué, euh, 
l'expression que vous avez soulignée, solus remansi in campo. Euh, et, et donc, euh, un des éléments que vous avez souligné, c'est qu'il y a des traces d'éthique chevaleresque. Et alors, cela, il m'a fait réfléchir sur, sur une chose que souvent, quand je pense à la, à la première école franciscaine, euh, dans mon ignorance et surtout pour le fait que j'étudie euh, l'école parisienne franciscaine, on pense toujours à, à des franciscaines qui ont une certaine culture, disons. Mais bien sûr, vous avez montré qu'il s'agit des Italiens qui, qui s'étaient convertis probablement euh, en euh, suivant directement François. Et, mais est-ce que, alors, dans les... J'avoue que je ne sais pas ce qui sont les, les premiers convertis. convertis sont des... Vous avez dit qu'il y a un contexte militaire euh, euh, et puis l'ignorance du, du latin. Euh, mais de toute façon, ils connaissent assez les textes euh, biblique qui est cite. Donc, quel euh, état social avait euh, les convertis, les premiers convertis franciscains Alors, je réponds en français ou en anglais euh, Qu'en pensent Julia et Dragoche euh... Non, vous pouvez co continuer en anglais, je ne veux pas. <rire> non, en français aussi, parce que c'est du bon français. Alors, <rire> Merci. Mais, euh, alors, ce n'est peut-être pas moi qui saurais le mieux répondre euh, à cette question, mais il me semble que les milieux sont assez divers. Euh, bon, François lui-même, donc on sait, c'est un fils de marchand. Parmi les premiers euh, compagnons, il y a par exemple euh, Ruffin, euh, le cousin de sainte claire hein, qui appartient à un milieu aristocratique et qui lui-même, euh, donc euh, chevaleresque, euh, même seigneurial, et qui, qui a lui-même une formation, mais plutôt en droit. Euh, bon, un peu plus tard, il y aura Thomas de Celano qui visiblement a était un bon élève dans les écoles, sans être passé par l'université, euh, probablement, mais euh, bon, puis on a des, des frères euh, qui visiblement étaient illettrés, on a des, fr des frères, euh, des clercs qui sont entrés, euh, donc qui avaient reçu une instruction, et puis euh, visiblement, d'après Thomas de Celano, on voit que de temps en temps, il y a des universitaires euh, qui entre, ce qui pose la question de, de, de la place des livres, de, de, de l'instruction, euh, parce que ces frères, par exemple, ils ont l'habitude de prier avec le bréviaire, et, qui est un objet luxueux, très cher. Et ça, or, à un moment donné, euh, Saint François, par exemple, euh, euh, vend une Bible. Euh, pour venir en aide à des pauvres. Donc, il y a une tension là euh, entre euh, justement enfin, les habitudes de, de ces différents milieux, euh, mais probablement le, le, le milieu moyen se devait être plutôt que des illettrés ou des, des, des très lettrés, des, des semi-lettrés. Hein peut-être un peu comme Saint-François qui, qui connaît du latin et, mais, mais pas un latin parfait comme on a vu tout à l'heure mais avec une certaine diversité Merci beaucoup Je vous en prie so. Did, did we have other questions? Did others have, have uh, um, further questions or remarks to address to Dominique? Well, I, I think not. Well, uh, lastly, I would 
I would love to add that I, I have appreciated the, the um, all the clues that you have <laughs> uh, given to us in order to remain to uh, to it's the ten, the temptation to date and, and, and attribute the text always. You won't necessarily to know who has written this text and where, but all these clues, although they are very, very um, uh, shiny and they, they suggest very much the, the fact that the text uh, pertains to a certain milieu, uh, un, un, undeniable, and you have, you have not <laughs> though attributed the text. And, and this is in my view, this is the the attitude of a of a scholar who really um, temperates the, all the methods and knows that there is a certain uh, question mark that it cannot be resolved, and the attribution is always more or less true. And thank you for um, learning us how to approach a text and and also um see the limits of the text um, through all the methods and the whole this uh, interdisciplinarity that is needed to analyze a, a medieval text yes. may i add two little things uh, sure because i didn't say it and i think it's important first uh, uh irene said uh, that she was uh, stroke she had wouldn't have thought of the, the in campo Sulus Remans in campo and neither I at first it's because uh, a colleague Nicole Berriou uh, attracted my uh, attention about about it so I would say first thing we are not alone and it's always useful to share with colleagues to discuss and that's very important and the second, which is maybe not less important, is that we, of course, we have lots of questions about a text when uh, we discover it, we edit it, it, and we work. We have lots of questions, who? But in order to answer that question, we must absolutely forget them. I mean, read the text, uh, naively trying to read and reread and to penetrate it to 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 understand to understand its internal logic uh, independently of all our interrogations our all our ways of thinking and after we have forgotten our questions now we can begin to find uh, cues without prejudice and to be well maybe i didn't succeed but i tried and i think that forgetting our modern questions in we will find them at the end of course but trying to to put them into parentheses i think it's important to, mm -hmm. just to hear the text of course, and that is the, your first um, introduction, uh, your, your first sentence from the introduction to give uh, credit to the text you are reading mm -hmm. and have faith that it, it, it is a, an important text, even though it's full of mistakes and <laughs> in, that does have inco incoherent mm -hmm. yes. expressions. Yes. Thank you very much, Dominique, and thank, thank you, you all for assisting to our first <laughs> conference. And I have personally very much learned. And yes, <laughs> it you was all a pleasure I'm sure. to meet every one of you. Yes, and see you the next time when Mark Smith will be presenting um, the next conference on, on the formation of national scripts, which will be also very, very interesting. Oh. May I hear too? Right, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> What's the date? I forget. <laughs> What's the date? What is the date? The next one. It's November. That's the twenty fifth of um, November. Twenty fifth, right? Same, same hour. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Dominique, once again. Merci, Dominique. Okay. Bravo. Dominique. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Au revoir à tout le monde. See Merci you next beaucoup. time. Bye bye. Bye.
Bye. Bye bye. bye. Ciao. Grazie. Grazie.